All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. So today I'm presenting on Say Your Sorry, Forgiveness and Emancipation in light of the Royals' visit to Jamaica. So when I originally conceptualized this paper, the Queen was celebrating her Platinum Jubilee and she was being represented across the Commonwealth by younger Royals like William and Kate, Duke and Duchess of Windsor. However, by the time I penned this fuller presentation, a lot had happened. Okay? So the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II has died, and we recall that she was the longest serving British monarch in history. And the reigns of the monarchy has now passed over to King Charles III. So the entire world is abuzz with questions about what this transition means, especially for constitutional monarchies like Jamaica, for whom the British monarch remains head of state. So I think that this has added some urgency to the critique that I wanted to make of the royal's visit to Jamaica. And I do so by deploying the idea of emancipation, which according to Antiguan theologian and pastor Courtright Davis is the Caribbean word for liberation. And in my critique, I'm attempting to foreground the idea of forgiveness and its socio-political expression in the call for an apology and for reparations using the tagline of the Jamaican protests that were crafted by the Advocates Network. So that's where say your sorry comes from, or in Jamaica, or in English, say your sorry. So say your sorry, say your sorry. And I attempt to weave into the conversation relevant visual representations, including this poster, which was designed by the Advocates Network as the important visual for the platform against the Royals visit. And you'll notice that this sign that has been designed, to my mind, is reminiscent of Martin Luther's 95 thesis that he nailed on that door. Albeit you'll see here that this sign with its demands is actually tied to an image of the gates of Buckingham Palace. So what I'm attempting to do is to argue that liberation, emancipation remains a contemporary already not yet that cannot and should not be ignored in religious spaces. So a quick and very brief background to this Say You're Sorry campaign and why we're even having this conversation today. So when the Duke and Duchess of Windsor landed in Kingston, Jamaica in March of 2022, they were met by full-throated opposition and protest from a wider cross-section of Jamaican society. So take a look at this image. The, this time, the usual suspects, and the usual suspects would be the Rastafari community, right? This time, the usual suspects were joined by Jamaicans from all walks of life. At the helm of the protests, of course, were the Advocates Network with their Say Your Sorry campaign. And among the various activities that the campaign you, you know, was built up around was an open letter to the royals, which noted the coincidence of the Queen's 70th anniversary and Jamaica's 60th anniversary of independence from Britain. And the advocates charged that the Queen had done nothing to redress or to atone for the suffering of my ancestors that took place during her reign or during the entire period when Britain trafficked Africans, enslaved them, put uh, Asians under indentureship and basically colonized Jamaica and other parts of the empire. So the letter was accompanied by 60 reasons for the royals to apologize and to pay reparations to Jamaica. And of course, we recognize that this is also relevant to other parts of the Caribbean as well. Now, on the day that the official visit began, dozens of protesters gathered in front of the British High Commission, demanding not only apology, but also reparations for the horror of the transatlantic slave trade. And the signage that uh, many of the protesters held, as you can see from this example here, bore the words of the campaign, say you're sorry, apologize now, or, or variations of that theme. The protesters used loudspeakers to read the 60 reasons over and over again. And eventually we were allowed to present a copy of our letter to a representative of the British High Commission, showing you that here. 
the advocates made and continue to make their case in numerous media and social media spaces. And Rosalie Hamilton, Professor Rosalie Hamilton, one of the founders of the group argued, and I'm quoting her here, an apology is the best Jubilee gift that the Queen can give to us. It's the first step in a long process of reparatory justice, end quote. Now, in spite of all of this, in the former speech at the state dinner that was given in their honor, Prince William said, among many fatuous things, and I'm quoting him here, I strongly agree with my father, the Prince of Wales, as he was then, who said in Barbados last year that the appalling atrocity of slavery forever stains our history. I want to express my profound sorrow. Slavery was abhorrent and it should never have happened. While the pain runs deep, Jamaica continues to forge its future with determination, courage, and fortitude. And I'll end it there. His words, as you can imagine, caused a lot of consternation. Many people were affronted by him even daring to say that, remembering two other things that had been said, for example, British prime minister of the past coming and telling us to get over it, you know, enslavement is past, forget about it. So the, the advocates continue to press the Jamaican government for a timeline for a referendum on us becoming a republic, which the prime minister promised in his response to the prince. So this is what our prime minister said. He said, we're moving on and we intend to attain in short order to fulfill our true ambitions as an independent, developed and prosperous country, end quote. Now, if we look at all of this through sort of theological lens and look at it from the perspective of the emancipation, liberation trope, which I think is important, what we're seeing there is that the response is around an imperative to decolonize Caribbean life and to emancipate Caribbean people from neocolonialism and neo-imperialism. And that has always been central to Caribbean theological discourse. The emancipatory imperative calls for theological self-reliance, rejecting dependence on and imitation of theologies from the metropoles. Furthermore, this theological enterprise needs to be very practically focused in order to respond effectively to the needs of Caribbean people, including their economic life, their political distresses and their socio-historical circumstances. And what that should do is that that should lead us into a praxis that contributes to shaping a life that is anti and decolonial in its makeup. So what's going on theologically in the Caribbean with regards to this particular discourse around reparations, even though our Caribbean theological discourse has largely been shaped and talked through uh, emancipation as an important trope in how we should shape and see and live and theologize. Well, I'm, I'm saying that I see our cause for emancipation and decolonization as being pretty localized and don't contemplate the kind of engagement towards reparation, which I see as a recent phenomenon in our human rights discourse in the region. So such reparation discourse I see is very minuscule and a very, very recent thread among Caribbean theologians and among the Caribbean churches. So I use the example of Grenadian Baptist pastor, young pastor, Vonnie James, who attempts to craft what he calls a reparation theology based on a biblical foundation. And he actually calls out the lack of a reparation theology in the region where church is supposed to be a prophetic voice, but somehow has remained suspiciously silent on this very pressing issue of uh, reparations, apology, true emancipation, and so on. So if I listen to Garnet Roper, and Garnet is a Jamaican evangelical theologian, when he speaks with regard to the church having failed to develop Caribbean theology as a public theology operating in the public sphere to bring God's grace, God's power and wisdom in working for justice and equality. And I'm quoting Garnet here, in a manner that seeks to approximate the eschatological ideal, 
end quote. Now approximating this eschatological ideal, the already not yet dimension of our existence requires us as church to engage in advocacy and yes, to engage in protest on behalf of the vulnerable. So church, we are called upon to collaborate with others to advocate and to protest. And I think this is especially important because church does have something to say about the meaning of apology, about the meaning of forgiveness, about the meaning of reparation. But we haven't been vocal enough in doing that. So when I look at the work, for example, of individual pastors and theologians, again, um, Sean Major Campbell, an Anglican priest, theologian, social activist, human rights protester, he makes a very public call for an apology from the royal family for their history of enslavement. And for me, this is a great example of advocacy. Uh, Father Major Campbell is actually a part of our advocates network. And he claims and makes his claims in the public square using the language of human rights without explicitly grounding his conversation in the theological. And I think Sean does that because Sean is very aware that many of the interlocutors in our public space do not see church, do not see religion, do not see Christianity as having anything to say because Christianity has been so deeply implicated in and benefited from enslavement and indentureship and colonization. So many people will not listen to us. They don't even think we have solutions to bring to the conversation. However, because Sean makes his argument in the public square, and I look at his work, for example, in writing in, in the traditional media, and he does a lot of stuff on Facebook as well, I found that he makes a really cogent argument about forgiveness where he indicts the church and he says that there are ways that we as church understand forgiveness and has and as church we have supported forgiveness that actually may be damaging to people like ourselves who are in a space of calling for and reflecting on forgiveness and what that means in the context of reparation and even the process of calling for forgiveness in that context, we have to be careful as church how we do it. So in regard to reparation, he actually asked this question and allow me to quote him. He says, might perfunctory forgiveness be an opiate to silence the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade, the victims of white supremacy and racism and the cause for reparatory justice, end quote. So what Major Campbell then suggests is that to avoid this, quote, forgiveness with its theological import must therefore be subjected to the lens of human rights concerns and the process of psychological engagement. I'm wrapping up, I'm wrapping up. Where am I going with this? I, I think it's not unsurprising that the clamor for reparations and Republican status for Jamaica and other constitutional monarchies has grown louder since the Queen's death. Arguably, the passing of Queen Elizabeth resurfaces the concerns with her role as monarch working to present a benign face to empire and the missed opportunities for apology and for repair. The advocacy of groups such as the Advocates Network in our call on the British monarchy to say sorry continues to be amplified in the local, regional, and international media. The commitment to reparations and Republican status has not eased but has grown in momentum, nor has the moment for theological reflection on apology and reparations passed. It has simply deepened. Indeed, and I'm quoting here, the modern church should have a keen interest in restorative justice. And in this regard, the cause for reparation and restorative justice must form a wholesome part of religious teaching. Therefore, as the Jamaica Bicentenary Committee argues, sorry is never enough. As an apology calls for concrete reparatory action, for regional development and efforts to reclaim political sovereignty, cultural renewal, economic independence, and Caribbean unity in which the churches need to be fully engaged. Thank you very much. And the second uh, presentation from Anna, 
So it is so powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is so powerful act, uh, action and activities and uh, protesting. So I saw you. I saw you. So I'm very happy to learn about uh, protesting <laughs> from you. So as you know, the, in South Korea, we also we gone through the uh, gone through the Japanese colonial. Uh, during the 1919 and to 1995. So, however, uh, Japan never uh, gave an apology for uh, for their occupation and force in the Korean Peninsula. So, uh, in this sense, your presentation is so touched me uh, in terms of protesting in using say you you are sorry, yes, forgiveness process. So I have a loan from you. Thank you again. So and also uh, during your uh, during your presentation, it uh, I remind I reminded about the uh, the, the woman comfort woman issues in South Korea. Uh, is the, uh, yeah they have a sexual uh, sexual victims from the Japanese colonial in the Japanese colonial era. So we have we continuously arguing, say sorry, yeah, apology from apology from the Japanese, but they never uh, say sorry than anything. So yeah. And then uh, I like the point about the using the Caribbean theology and using uh, emancipation, emancipation is emancipation rather than the liberation. Yeah, liberation. So I point out, I, I point, I think that this is very important um, of uh, important uh, theory or in the Caribbean theology. So I would learn about this as well. So, and then uh, my question is also, also is the human in, in, in Caribbean theology, how can you identify or justify the human or human beings? Human beings in your uh, in your perspective uh, in the Caribbean context. So this is my question. So yeah, sorry for the my humble uh, response <laughs> response because yeah, I just heard about now the, your stories. And I'm very happy to learn the, the liberation and action and also the issue of LGBTQI. Thank you. Thank you so much. What we do. So my response, I think, can can work in in both instances because. The human in the Caribbean is oftentimes a space of, of devaluing. So persons like myself who are African descended are coming from a lineage of not human. In fact, we're coming from a lineage of property. And so my challenge to church and as part of church is how as church we continue to, to craft and to shape theologies that don't allow the dignity, the full dignity of the human person to be acknowledged, to be accepted, to be restored. And it ties in very, very strongly with how Alex is presenting their perspective on their experience, because our spaces, our theological ecclesial spaces also devalue on the lines of sex and gender, whether it's talking about women as you know, not to be seen in church or not to be among the leadership of church and so on, or how it talks about the abnormality of the LGBTQI community and not being open to diversity as it exists in humanity. So the, the, the beauty of diversity, whether it's about racial diversity, whether it's about gender or sex, whether it's even about citizenship, and how we are part of and able to shape our socio-political world um, is part of the challenge of human dignity and part of the challenge of how church informs or even deforms human dignity. So that's part of how I'd like to start off my answer to both you and Michael and to also uh, pay homage to, to, to Alex as well. Thank you. Thank you. 